next speaker is uh, Kevin Sanders from the University of Bath. And um, I'm going to take a breath and read the title of <laughs> It's Radical Librarianship, the Politics and Mechanics of DIY Culture and How Librarianship Might Be Able to Learn from Grassroots Organisations. I think I deserve a prize for reading that. <laughs> so Kevin um, has worked in a range of academic libraries since uh, 2008, um, most recently uh, in subject librarianship in the University of Bath, and he's since moved on to tech, the Technical Services Department at the University, sorry, University of Huddersfield, and now he's in the University of Bath in Technical Services. Um, Kevin has published work in the Journal of Librarianship and Scholarly Communication, and he's co-founding editor of the Journal of Radical uh, Librarianship. And um, it was born out of the uh, birth of Radical, Libra the Li Radical Librarians uh, Collective, of which Kevin is an active member. And he Currently, frequently quotes Samuel Beckett, so that will appeal to us here. So, um, and the Journal of Radical Librarianship is a, an open access um, uh, journal um, with a group of editors and uh, peer review. And so, I would welcome Kevin, give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I suck at presenting. Uh, just let's get that out of the way first of all. Uh, so. Come and grab me afterwards and we'll have a chat. I'm, I'm much better at that sort of thing. Uh, but I'm here to talk about uh, radical librarianship and how I think that our profession can, can benefit from the mechanics and operations that are commonly associated uh, with uh, radical and grassroots organisation. Uh, my Twitter handle here, Moan and Drone, uh, make of that what you will, and my email address, kjsanders at riseup.net. And this string of random characters here is my public uh, PGP key. If you come to Alison's talk later, uh, you may be able to get some PGP keys set up and you can send me a nice encrypted email. Oh, PGP seven, sorry. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, who am I? Well, I'm the e-resources librarian at the University of Bath. Um, that means I deal with a lot of engagement with uh, publishers. Uh, I sort of administrate the... Uh, open URL link resolver at the university. I look after the easy proxy server as well. Um, before that, I was the subject librarian at the University of Huddersfield, and I've had a range of paraprofessional roles at uh, various HEI institutions around the UK. And I'm also going on to be a research, research support librarian just over a, a week's time uh, in London, because I like a bit of stress in my life, so I add more to the mix. Uh, but what does this really say about me? Uh, what, what, does it, what does it say about my approach to librarianship? And I, honestly, I don't think it says a great deal. And I think this is an issue that we have, um, particularly within academic libraries, where we, look, we gaze far too much into the mirror, in my view, and we look at what pre-exists and we repeat that. This has some advantages, don't get me wrong. It means that we can provide consistent services to our users, and this is all for the good. But equally, I think this can be quite a, a negative thing, too, uh, because we're not... Uh, allowing ourselves the opportunity to bring other aspects into the profession. And my personal identity, which has very strongly informed my professional identity, has been highly developed through engagement in more active DIY cultures. So the pictures on the screen that you see here are me skateboarding and uh, doing music. I'm heavily involved in, uh, in DIY music. And you might be thinking, quite reasonably, what on earth have these ideas got to do with librarianship? Well, I'll take skateboarding first. We often use uh, metaphors surrounding architecture uh, in librarianship. We talk about the information landscape and so on and so forth. And if we extend that metaphor a little while, uh, we can perhaps see where I come from uh, in terms of bringing skateboarding into this. Architecture in this field of, um, in, in the scholarship surrounding uh, uh, architecture, there is a strong discourse of architecture being seen as a violent um, thing how it creates our subjection to power, uh, how we respond to our environment. Well, Ian Borden uh, is a fantastic academic. He's done a lot of work on skateboarding, identity, and space. He says um, that the architect, as a designer of the built terrains, is both the other to the skateboarder and represented within the skateboarder. The creative act of being transposed from the classicist realm of balanced order into the romanticist sphere of destabilized movements Architecture is dissolved, recast, and rematerialized. And this is crucial to how I approach librarianship. It really, really is a fundamental part of who I am and how I see the world. I don't, and this is not exclusive to skateboarders or anything like that, but I don't merely accept what I see as the way things are done. 
I, I see alternatives and potential and ways to recast and rematerialize the world. And this is something that I think we could do far more proactively in the field of librarianship than we, particularly academic librarianship, than, than, we, than we often do. I think this is a, a real, there's real scope here for development. The other aspect that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm raising in this image is the, my engagement with DIY, DIY music. I've been involved with this sort of thing for around about 20 years now. From my uh, salad days uh, in, in hardcore and punk music, uh, and now into sort of more uh, sort of mild and meek-mannered drone stuff. What this has done really for me is introduced me to the technology of the collective. It really has informed how I interact with other people in order to develop ideas and form communities and build these for the benefit of all. This is a really crucial element. And my engagement with the DIY music scene has really, really allowed me the opportunity to develop a lot of, a lot of key skills. Um, what am I going to waffle on about next? <laughs> uh, and it's important to recognise that um, this is, it's, it's against, it's, uh, it's outside of the mainstream. Uh, and therefore, there's a strong connection with my personal identity uh, and, and an investment within that community and that, that it's a, a sort of mutual relationship between the two. And I think this is a really, really important thing in terms of developing a new and alternative power dynamic. A large, as I've said, a lot of this is, is from an underground um, and outsider perspective. And that something that I, I do inherently like about this is that it disagrees with uh, the idea of conforming to predominant political and social practices. The assumed and predominant liberal stance, one that in practice supports the status quo or the hegemonic ideology as referred to here by Seal, uh, uh, reinforces common sense positions and subsumes alternative perspectives, perspectives rendering them within. And this is something that I really, really struggle with uh, academic library practice. We, we often stifle ourselves by, by limiting outside of voices and pushing them away and not giving them a platform to develop that opportunity and seeing alternative ways of doing things. Indeed, I'd even go as far as to suggest that a lot of this stuff and the way that we practice academic librarianship abstracts the human and social nature that's at the core of our work with information. It renders our agency to be less important than that of the oft-repeated and utterly fallacious maxim about the neutrality of librarians and libraries. If we look at the quote from Illich here, uh, we can see that he says that information about the world is created within the organism and through its interaction with the world. And this really highlights the importance of, actively learning, uh, of active learning and cognition and not merely the passive consumption of information. But a lot of this sort of, these sorts of ideas are still very much outside of mainstream academic library practice. And a lot of the documentation that we see surrounding these sorts of things, a lot of the models, are based very much on the idea that um, we pour more information into the student and then eventually at some point they're topped up and they're magically information literate. Well, I don't think that's necessarily the case. We have to engage with the more critical aspects of uh, evaluation. Now, there's a discourse building around this with significant contributions from people like Lauren Smith, Emily Drabinsky, Andrew Whitworth, to name but, but a few. But a lot of these voices are still very much marginalised. They're not really... Um, their ideas are not coming into practice as directly as I would personally like to see. So with all of this being said, that's a very long-winded introduction, uh, I'd like to talk more about the Radical Librarians Collective, how it's formed, uh, what we try and do, the structure of the group, um, and the things that we're looking to do in the future. The collective was formed a few years ago um, as an umbrella title for a freely associating collective of autonomous, politically conscious librarians and information workers. Now, if we unpick the word soup that's there from some pompous sod who wrote that in a journal, we can see that there is um, a strong emphasis on autonomy, collectivism, and dismantling the hierarchy between professional and para paraprofessional peers. And these are very much key points to the Radical Librarians Collective, its aim, and indeed means of organisation. We got going in around about 2013. Uh, we were in the middle there in the UK of a Tory-led coalition where we were seeing aggressive cuts, further aggressive cuts to public funding, and threats to public services, and a strong and increasingly aggressive use of the neoliberal discourse of competition and efficiency that we're also familiar with. We largely met uh, online through social media. Uh, we were a kind of disparate group of individuals, but we formed as a group, uh, as we saw that others were willing to dissent from a lot of the mainstream discourses that are 
apparent in the profession. We were clearly in search of alternatives, and that these alternatives very much had social equity and individual liberty taking a higher priority than things like customer satisfaction. But this online communication was very much und underpinned by local alignments. I was making a lot of connections at the time in Yorkshire, where I was based. I was at the University of Huddersfield at this point. I was making a lot of uh, connections in Sheffield, Leeds, and Bradford, and going and meeting people. And this is something that the collective has developed, and I'll, I'll come on to talking about later. This is something that other people have been doing and creating stronger connections locally, which leads to much more uh, progressive possibilities for uh, the Radical Log Rounds Collective as a group. But it's very much important for me to emphasise that the collective is absolutely no kind of vanguard. We, we certainly don't try and see ourselves that way. Uh, we're politically and philosophically related to many pre-existing groups like the Progressive Librarians Guild, uh, Radical Reference in the States as well, and also the Librarians and Archivists with Palestine group. Uh, the, you know, we're, we're very much trying to make those connections and build on the, the, the work that others are doing as well and not trying to lead or steer something in a, in a, in a direction that we think is arbitrarily right. Uh, but for the sake of clarity, uh, it's really important for me to say that whilst I personally and the collective perhaps as a, uh, as a whole often disagrees with uh, some of the, 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 the common uh, thoughts and practices of, uh, our, of, our, of our work, we're certainly not against institutions or people or uh, the profession at large. We're very much trying to just offer alternatives and build and, and, try, and, and try and build a more hopeful future and not just uh, continue... Uh, the work that others already do. So I've spoken about my own personal history uh, about in terms of skateboarding and music, but the, the collective as a whole is a, is a pretty broad church. And whilst we were founding, there were some common themes surrounding activism, uh, which was expressed in various ways through engagement with trade unions. We had a lot of case workers and reps, and those uh, people working in cooperatives and social centres, that kind of thing. Uh, we also had uh, hunt saboteurs, people who were really prepared to to go out and fight directly against uh, things that they thought socially were not necessarily great. And we're a lot of members from the LGBTQI community as well. And we've even got uh, some Pearl Jam fans in the, in the collective, so we're, we're really not some kind of monolith of radical activists, I promise. That we, we increasingly have, uh, have had more people who've been uh, intrigued by the, uh, the sorts of conversations that we've been having against the commodification of information. Uh, there is, however, a strong prevalence of the uh, marginalised and alternative voices within the collective and people who have a warm regard for cooperative and participatory organisation. And this is really, really important. It's important to remember as well because it's also built in a significant amount of resilience through the camaraderie that we share. When, a few years ago, when, when we were founding, we faced quite a lot of uh, public mocking uh, by various people in the UK. People said that we were hanging out in our ivory towers and that we hunting packs. There's no irony lost there in critiquing our solidarity. Uh, but the sense of community that we had as a collective and the mutual support that we shared gave us a really strong resilience. And this is something that's not a small issue. This is something that's really, really important to, to see as a positive for the collective and how we can uh, offer alternatives for people and bring that community element within ourselves. So the first thing that we did as a collective was organise a, a national meeting, uh, which we held at, uh, in Bradford. Uh, it was really important for us that we didn't exclude anybody, so there was no co cost associated with attending the event. Uh, we relied entirely on a donations basis, and as such, that meant that we were under financial precarity ourselves. But my experience from the DIY music scene meant that I was very well versed in finding cheap to low cost venues and that kind of experience allowed us uh, to, to bring that, that direct social experience into the professional sphere and a number of other colleagues in the collective uh, had a range of experiences of a not dissimilar style and they brought that to the fore and it really gave us a practical uh, stronghold in, in forming as a collective and delivering this, uh, this meeting. We really wanted to hold the, the event in a radical space but obviously this limited the number of options that were available to us. And eventually we found the Bradford Resource Centre, which you can see an image of here. <clears throat> uh, there was a strong emphasis on the day of supporting, amplifying and engaging with marginalised voices. So we were, strong, we were very aware of things like accessibility uh, and disability, gender representation, race and trying to be as inclusive as we could. So we encouraged all participants to bring food with them, but to label it so that people from all forms of whatever your dietary requirements or if you are of faith, 
that you would know whether it was okay for you to eat or not. So we were, we were trying to be as, uh, we were modeling practice based on our experiences. We followed the, the unconference format. Uh, this meant that we didn't have to impose uh, as a collective the, the means of the day you know, by, by, by sort of state saying what would be discussed and what wouldn't be discussed. And this is a really good way to break down that hierarchy and see us not as a centralized force, but saying, come on, let's all get involved and let's have a chat and let's define what we're going to talk about ourselves as a group rather than us leading it. But this is by no means a panacea, and it didn't go perfectly. We certainly got things with regard to accessibility wrong. Um, the resource centre is a brilliant space, but it's an old industrial building, and as such, there was a lot of stairs involved, and that meant there was a lot of accessib accessibility issues for, for a number of people. And our experiences as since, as I'll come on to in a moment, have meant that we've been more selective about how we choose to, uh, where we choose to uh, hold meetings and so forth. Um, but we also struggle with, with representation. We really struggle um, as a profession, I think, I don't think it's going to be a controversial thing to say. We struggle with race representation um, in general, and that's no mean, we, we absolutely do reflect that within the collective, unfortunately. Uh, but we also struggle with, uh, struggle with gender representation as well. There is a strong prevalence of uh, the male voice uh, speaking, and I'm guilty of it right now. I'm, I'm doing it again, but I'm aware of it, and I try and criticise it and, 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 and do so publicly. Uh, so, but we do, you know, we do have these issues, and we do try and work, work on them. After this, we, uh, the, the, the few of us that were involved in organising the Bradford meeting were very reticent to uh, organise another one because we were really keen to not be seen as some kind of uh, central power of the collective. We wanted to democratise it and, and, and sort of cast it out for others. But after a while, we kind of caved in. <laughs> we were keen to keep momentum going and we wanted to, to, to organise another event. So we organised one uh, in London. We again did it at a radical space, this time at the London Action Resource Centre. Uh, a different thing, whilst entirely relying on donations again, we uh, provided food this time. Uh, it seemed like a sensible thing to do. So we had a, a local cooperative uh, who provided all the food for us, which was great. Uh, all still, as I say, relying on donations, which we uh, accrued a, a small uh, excess, which allowed us to then fund some of the fixed costs that we had in terms of servers that we were starting to develop in our IT infrastructure as we were growing as a sort of uh, organisation. And some of the outcomes after the, this meeting included a collaborative peer-reviewed uh, journal article, also the open access declaration, which uh, Stuart Lawson uh, wrote, which meant that a lot of us uh, chose to sign, which said that any work that we did around library and information science would be open access by default, and that we wouldn't rescind on that. And then we also founded the Journal of Radical Librarianship as a sort of progression of that. After this, there was the Huddersfield meeting in 2015. This time, in order to, because as I say, we'd recognised the issue of, around power and uh, it being seen that there was some kind of centralised organising committee, we sent out an, uh, an email to uh, a, a mail list that we'd set up to all the people that had come to previous events and had chosen to sign up. And we said, do you want to be involved in organising the 2015 meeting? And we had quite a, a number of new people. It was around about 50-50 in terms of pre-existing uh, old-timers. Uh, and new people who got involved with the, the organisation of the Huddersfield meeting. We wanted to put it in a new place, so it wasn't in either Bradford, like up north in Yorkshire, or down south in that there, London. But we did struggle to find places that, that uh, matched with our ethics, uh, in terms of being like kind of radical spaces, but equally with cost and accessibility for, for a range of, uh, for, for the whole nation. We looked at places around sort of Birmingham, Manchester, uh, Nottingham and Leeds, Unfortunately, a lot of the radical spaces, because of virtue of their, uh, of their circumstance, they're, they're kind of relatively poor, uh, and they were very small, all of one lot, one room kind of venues, which we'd had experience with not being suitable for, for a, a lot of people, a lot of sound travels. Um, so eventually, we settled on Huddersfield, where we didn't choose a radical space, but we had a public space, uh, and, it, and it was a kind of compromise. But it was a very well-attended meeting. Uh, a lot of new people came who hadn't been who hadn't been to any of the, the, the previous meetings. Uh, and it was a, as you can see by this image, which is from the evening, it was a, a pretty wild day, uh, and a lot, of, a lot of good conversations were had, uh, and it was, a, it was a success. And a bit of a sort of marketing tip here. This is the, the next one, which is going to be in Brighton. Looks like it'll be on the 9th of July, um, and I thoroughly encourage anybody to, to come over to it uh, and to bring ideas to the fore. Uh, if you're you know, interested in getting accommodation, 
give me an email or come and have a chat with me. I'm sure we can sort you out with something because we don't want to make people have to pay for things. But one thing that's really important to be aware of within the collective is our um, safer spaces policy. Um, so we're very much aware um, of the power structures that exist between that it, within society and how that can seep into our practices as a radical collective. Safe space policies have a somewhat of, I think, of a media myth around them uh, in that they limit freedom of speech, but this really couldn't be further from the truth. They prevent hate speech. They allow the community to mutually agree on a set of, set of shared behaviours that minimise or ideally withdraw the stratification that privilege brings to our social circumstances. It's important to recognise that this is self-imposed and agreed upon as a principle of engagement. And we not only use it at meetings, but also online. So I really encourage all groups to have a safer spaces policy, and it'd be really cool if ASL could have one in their future meetings. I think that would be really cool to take a, a collective responsibility for our social circumstances. And it enables everybody to feel secure in spite of the inequities that exist within our world. <coughs> Part of the rationale of having a safer spaces policy is that it emphasises some of the differences that we, that we have between us within the collective, and it brings them to the fore and allows us to recognise them. And this is important because um, it, it, it means that we don't see ourselves as a monolith. Uh, we, we can recognise those differences. And seeing these differences makes us stronger as a collective. It allows us to more wholly engage without interpolating the collective to the white patriarchal values that are dominant within our culture. As Foucault says, there is no single locus of the great refusal, no soul of revolt, source of all rebellions, or pure law of the revolutionary. Instead, there's a plurality of resistances, each of them a special case. Resistances are distributed in an irregular fashion, where the points, knots, focuses of resistance are spread over time and space in varying densities. And just as the network of power relations ends by forming a dense web that passes through apparatus and institutions without being exactly localised within them, so too the swarm of points of resistance traverses social stratifications and individual unities. So this crucially means that we have to find those discursive social connections that we have between us in order to provide a more uh, participatory struggle against the issues that we perceive within the world. And this really ties in with the collective's desire to not really replicate pre-existing uh, resistance, but to build an active community that operates in a different and variant way, and not to usurp power systems, but to replace them with more equitable social solutions that value participation, engagement, and diversity. Now, I, I feel kind of uneasy uh, quoting, as a, as a white cis man quoting uh, Audrey Lord here, but I wholeheartedly agree. The tools of neoliberal power are incapable of emancipating the oppressed majority, that, and we want to offer systems beyond what Adorno referred to as a pure reproduction of what has always already been. I mentioned earlier the technology of the collective, but there's also the idea within DIY culture of doing scene, of making it ourselves. And this is a, a collective establishment of an alternative scene as what Pepper notes as to establish and transform a managed space. Now a significant part of the difference for the space that the collective operates within is to move away from the dominant forces of centralization. And this is very common within uh, library practices, I perceive, and Western society at large. I'm not merely trying to wag my finger at uh, the librarians. But this centralisation alienates people. It limits the possibilities of forming communities, and it retains power and often mystifies the processes that lead to decisions being made. So the collective consciously tries to remove centralisation. So this is the reason we don't have a membership, for example. People are free to form and join at their will, and much like we formed a temporary group to uh, organise the 2015 meeting in Huddersfield, we formed temporary groups to do lots of tasks, and we don't have roles that people occupy. These are all temporary and not fixed. It's a really important thing for the collective. There's no formal leadership as such either. Of course, invisible hierarchies can and do emerge, but we try and challenge these by having some of those difficult conversations and recognising it, and asking other people when they feel uncomfortable to... to to, to bring it to us and say why they feel uncomfortable and hopefully we can try and resolve this and make sure we don't replicate the sorts of problems that we see, I'm seeing, seeing time up. <laughs> so we've got a bunch of regional groups all over the place. There's RLC Ireland, who are brilliant. Uh, I'm looking forward to having a chat with those guys later. 
Uh, da, da, da. We've met with loads of radical spaces. We've done loads of things in terms of managing all of that stuff and trying to work more uh, outside of the professional sphere and engaging more directly. So we've done things with, like London Anarchist Book Fair, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the Feminist Library asked to come and speak. That was really cool. Uh, and this is a really important thing to me. This is like my personal mantra. It's exactly why privileged fucks like me should feel obliged to whine and kick and scream until everyone has everything they need. Because as librarians, I think this is what we do. We provide people with the scope to come and find things. And we have to recognise it that we are a political force and not merely to passively engage with the power structures that pre-exist. I'm sorry for going on for that. <laughs> We'll start late with Kevin, so uh, we've time for one or two questions. Could I ask people to put their hands up, and could they say who they are, and could they wait for the microphone, because the live stream can't pick it up if, uh, if you don't take the microphone. So, um, David, there at the back. Uh, thanks. Uh, no, just make sure the green light is on. Hi, Kevin. David Hughes from Dublin Business School. We, we met last night. Um, thanks for carrying on a series of very interesting and thought-provoking talks that we've had yesterday and this morning from Sandra Collins. Um, are you familiar with PZ Miles? Indeed yeah. I am, yes. Yeah, he's an American atheist scientist blogger and he's quite radical in his own way. He rails against dictionary atheists. He thinks that if you're an atheist, you have some e ethical and moral responsibility to fight for social ju justice. So I'm thinking, do you see any analogies there with librarians? Is it our responsibility to be radical where we can? And then the second question, which comes from a, a tweet by Martin O'Connor over at the front there earlier during your talk, where he said, how easy is it for librarians to be radical in a conservative environment? Thank okay. you. So I would say that it's we, as librarians, I think we have to recognise and celebrate the fact that we do do quite radical things, uh, given the context of the world that we work in. Um, do we have a professional responsibility to be radical? I would say that we do, yeah. Um, I, think, I think that we do. Um, and always to do more, and always to strive to do more and do better, uh, but not to get bogged down in achieving some kind of end game. It's a, we're working within circumstances that are going to continually evolve. So, yeah, 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 uh, and, and I think we have that responsibility um, for the public good and to build the commons. We have the ca capacity to uh, inform uh, the commons by virtue of having access to the information that we share within that. So, yeah, I do think we have a responsibility. <laughs> Okay, Marta. And that's it, I'm afraid. Hi, Kevin. Marta Bustillo from Trinity College. Um, first, a comment. I think we are all radical librarians, even if we don't know it, because what we're doing is opening up information, um, and information is power, so we are all radical. But the other thing I, I wanted to ask you is, um, okay, so you... You're obviously using a lot of social media and the digital space and all of that. What are the advantages and disadvantages of that for your movement? Uh, well, they give us scope to engage, I think, with a broader, uh, to engage with a wider audience that we might otherwise have access to in more localized, r real world kind of environment. So they, there's, there's, there's that. But it also means that we can have multiple people managing the account, so we're not just having a singular voice promoting certain thoughts. Uh, we share the password within the collective quite freely, so lots of people can, have, can use the Radical Librarians Collective platform to put out their ideas. So uh, it gives different people the ability to engage from within as well as from without. But do you find that, uh, that being so visible online also has drawbacks or not? Yeah, I mean it does, <laughs> but, but you know, being invisible online has drawbacks too. So, of you course. know, it kind of checks and balances on both sides, but yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Kevin. And can we give Kevin a round of applause?